Greetings, I'm Morzalata Muhammad, and I'm here today with Tanahasi Coates, who is our Diversity Lecture Series speaker this February 2011. So, I know that you've only been in Grand Rapids for a very short while. That's right. So, have you had an opportunity to see anything besides our campus yet? I did see uh, the Amway Hotel where I'm <laughs> staying, and uh, that, that's quite a uh, nice institution. We did drive around a little bit from the airport. I think I saw East Grand Rapids. Okay. A lot of big houses. <laughs> All right. Uh, and downtown, but that's about it so far. Okay, so I know that tonight you'll be talking to a large and a very multi-generational, hopefully, group of people here in Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. and your your talk tonight it's it's called a deeper black. Yeah, and, and uh, that's always the branding we use, which is fine. But uh, <laughs> specifically, uh, I, I hope to talk about the uses of history uh, and how we understand history uh, and how we apply it to our politics uh, today. I think uh, a lot of us often want to appeal to the past for precedent. Uh, but often, in fact, the past challenges us and it's not particularly comfortable and we try to make it fit uh, into whatever parameters of the problems that we're having to deal with today. So I hope to just deal with that a little bit and uh, just try to encourage people to look to the past not so much for justification but for challenge. Okay, well actually that takes me to something that I was reading about you and there are a lot of descriptors for you and what you do in your writing. Um, one of the things I found that was really interesting was a, um, I think it was on your blog or um, reading about you and your bio that described you as immediate. So that, that what you do and your concerns is something immediate. Do you, can you explain what, what that descriptor might mean? I don't know because I didn't write that, but <laughs> I'll, 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 t I'll take a crack at okay. it. Um, it's funny to hear that because again, like I, I really try to uh, invoke history. History is it's just hugely important to me. Um, blogging is an art form that requires you to really be in the moment. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, you have to be immediate. Um, I think you have to be immediate in, in the other sense, and, and this is for any sort of writing that I'm doing. I, I try to write with a, with, a, with, a patch, with, a, with a passion, with a sense of urgency, uh, and so with a sense of the immediate in, 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 from that perspective. Uh, I very much write trying to grab people by the collars and shake them. Okay. Um, um, and in talking about writing, because actually I, I teach writing in the English department mm -hmm. here, so I'm always trying to get my students to think about their audience. Right. Um, and some of the things that you write when you write for, when you're not in the, the blog sort of atmosphere, right. do you, how do you decide like who your audience is? Do, do you have in, in certain types of writing a specific audience that you're trying to read? See, I'm gonna ruin it for, you, for your class. I, <laughs> I usually, I think about what I wanna read. That okay. really is what I think about. I think about what I, what I wanna read and I kinda, I, I trust that. Um, my initial impulses as a writer were, were pretty much based on the fact that uh, there were things out in the world that I wanted to read about that weren't really being written about. Um, and that was pretty, pretty much you know, my, my initial impetus into you know, being a professional writer. So I don't think audience too much. Uh, I want to be understood, I want to be clear, but these are all things that I, I would want for myself anyway. So you, you think about yourself as a potential audience? I literally think about, yeah. I think I write for myself, I really do. I mean, I, that, it sounds selfish, it isn't. I mean, if you have it, because there becomes a point where you realize you can't really write for other people. Now this is not like writing a business letter mm -hmm. or writing a letter of recommendation. I mean obviously you have an audience, a different audience that's not you and that sort of, sort of uh, scenario. But what I do in terms of the art of storytelling um, is very much about <laughs> pleasuring myself. I mean it really is. That's, that, again that, that sounds sort of arrogant but I think anyone who does anything and is you know, try, trying to do it at uh, the highest level that they possibly can manage that their potential will take them. Ultimately, they're really trying to please themselves. I okay. mean, that's really what they're so doing. let's see if you can help me out. Since you said you're going to ruin it for my Surely. first students. Surely. Um, I mean, was that always a sense? Because think about being learning about learning about your the craft of writing because you're you're an author, an right. editor, um, and see, a journalist. I'm just going to ruin it for your students <laughs> even more because for me it was. And see, what you have to understand is I um I'm a college dropout. I got kicked out of high school twice. I never excelled particularly well in terms of writing in the mm -hmm. classroom, but I always wrote. Uh, I wrote from the time I was five or six years old. My mother used to punish me and make me write essays when I had done <laughs> something wrong. I lived in a house where there were books overflowing everywhere. I was raised around hip hop and you know the literate sort of nature that I wrote lyrics, I wrote poems. So I, I always wrote and ultimately I really always wrote 
for me. I wrote, you know, because there was something that I wanted to hear that I was trying to get to. And so I'm obviously not trying to disparage the classroom, mm -hmm. uh, but I think I just took a different approach, and I, I, I always have taken a different approach. Well, part of that and what you, what you just said I think is really important is that you've been, you grew up in a, a literary in environment. You know, there's formal education and there's informal education. That's right. Um, and a lot of times students don't have, a lot of people do not have That's the right. benefit of growing up in a place where the punishment is writing. That's very true. <laughs> that's, that's very true. And for them, the approach would totally be different. Uh, for me, though, I have, I have great difficulty imagining myself as a writer, if not for the efforts of my parents, if not for my surroundings. Uh, I don't really know how else I would have gotten it. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe I would have. Maybe it would have come out in, in, in some other way. But for me, I was just so immersed in it. It wasn't like something that I went and did for an hour every weekday mm -hmm. uh, and then did homework. It was just, it was literally all around me. Um, there, were, there were books everywhere. There was writing everywhere. There was reading everywhere. Um, and so it's very difficult for me to imagine myself as a writer under any other circumstance. Because one of the things <clears throat> that... And I kind of grew up in the same kind of environment growing up um, in Detroit with parents who had converted to Islam, mm -hmm. the Nation of Islam. So it was mm -hmm. like history. You couldn't mm -hmm. escape it. But two things that you just said that I think is really important. Can I stop you? Sure. When did your parents convert? Just out of curiosity. Luckily, um, and I say luckily, before, right before, um, a couple years before I was born. Because okay. there are 12 of us. Okay. So I got to be born after the conversion and I didn't have to have two names and all that jazz. Okay. So it had to be, I would say, in uh, like 64, 65. Okay. I'm only asking, I'm actually working on a piece about Malcolm X, and I know he's from Michigan uh, and spent significant time and had deep connections with Detroit. So that was just yeah. really Like 64, 65 yeah. is when my parents, I think, probably converted. So he would have been leaving about then, or have left. Um, but, sorry, forgive no, me. No, but um, one of the things, two things that you pointed out that I think is very important, because you, you, you said something about writing and reading. and the, the fact, one of the things that I tell my students, first thing I tell them is that writing and reading are Siamese twins. Right. You, you can't you get can't rid do one of one. The other. That's right. <laughs> you need both of them. That's right. Um, and getting that message across, and when I say students, one of the things I want to emphasize it, it, at, a community, at community colleges, you have students across you know, age right. ranges. Right. So you're talking to people from different um, age groups and backgrounds, and, and for some of them, they could be 55, and this could be the first time right. that they hear that. Right. So, um, and the message you have that is the passion right. of, of doing that. So do you imagine, since you're not, you don't really imagine writing for others, but you're writing for this need in yourself. How you're writing, do you have some expectations for that writing once it's out there, how it might impact the people who read it? I hope people like it. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope people like it. I hope that, you know, my sense, it, I, you go to a museum, right, and there's a curator, somebody curates the exhibits, and mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and they put things together in, in a way, or they arrange the exhibit in such a way that they hope is pleasing to you. Um, but they can't literally think about you too much. Like they, can't, like they can't organize their exhibit by going out and taking a straw poll, for instance. They have to have some innate sense, some sense of beauty that really comes from here mm -hmm. that they're trying to bring forth. Uh, it's very much the same thing in writing. The writer has to trust, and I think this is probably true of any artist, the writer really has to trust that what they're feeling inside has some sort of ring in, in the broader humanity, that other people will recognize it too. So while it's true you are writing for yourself, you have to have some sort of belief that you have a feeling for what is beautiful in the world and what is specific and what is profound and what is interesting, and that other people will say, hey, you know what, I see that too. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have a, a kind of imagination. And I, I find that in situations where I think about what other people might want to read, I lose that imagination. Because the other part of that is audiences often don't know what they want to see until they see it. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that's true of me, you know, with movies and TV shows and all sorts of things. Uh -huh. um, I don't know until, but when I see it, I'm like, wow, that, that's pretty magical what you created there. Mm -hmm. um, but had you been thinking about what I would want to see, you would never have created that. It, exactly. Um, we were just discussing a, like a classic story by Annie Dillard in one of my classes. 
and she describes what a snowball looks like mm -hmm. when it hits a windshield and mm -hmm. everybody said that's exactly what it looked like <laughs> but if if you had told us but we'd have to describe that we right. wouldn't be able to right, right, but right. now with right. that example right. they see the right. possibility that you could be able to do something that's right um i want to switch gears and ask you something um a little bit about your um father and okay. something i read um when i was um, looking through your book, but okay. basically you can find this right on the, the cover and information about your book. One of the things, I think I, if I get it right, um, that he was a discoverer of histories or lost histories or something like that. Yeah, he was, uh, he republished uh, books by African American authors that had gone out of print. That was the business that he ran out of his, uh, out of, out of uh, the basement as I was a child. Okay, so how, do, how does that figure into what you do? Do you find it's huge. I mean, again, okay. I mean, you grow up and, you know, when I was born, my, my dad owned a, a small, uh, independent, private African-American bookstore um, on Park Heights in Baltimore. And so when you're literally raised around that, you know, and then you move to that, it, I was born in 75 and 78, he starts uh, a, a small publishing operation. You're just around it. You're just immersed in it. It's just everywhere. And so... Um, to some extent, there's a direct attempt to make you value history and get mm -hmm. you to value cultural things and that sort of things. But in, in other ways, it doesn't even need to be. It's just there. It's just there. I think when, if you look at um, when you talk about young African American kids, particularly of my generation, because you know that's what I can really speak to, what was lacking were tools for the imagination. There were not things around, interesting little things that would sort of spark your imagination and make you think about the world differently in the home, in the neighborhood, in, in, in the community. Mm -hmm. I was tremendously lucky because I had that. And one of those things was, I mean, you walk into the basement and people are publishing books. I mean, how, what more wonderful could, could it be than that? I mean, you know, I didn't think it was wonderful at the time, but in fact <laughs> it was. It was quite wonderful, you know, looking back on it. Uh, it was something else that I always so, carry with me. So do you find yourself looking for those pieces of history? And let me ask this, even if you do, what's the most, like, interesting thing that you discovered, like, on your own about history that was perhaps like stays with you now? Well, that's tough to rank. I think the whole process of uh, owning it and, and understanding that history is there for you to find and that knowing the facts is not enough, that again, your own, you know, your own specific thing that you see, I can give you a list of dates of when something happened. I can even tell you what happened on those dates, but you have to bring your own lens to the particular events to see some deeper significance. I mean, that really is the work of history, the ability to make these sort of connections that you know you, you, you can't necessarily see. I'm doing a lot of writing about the Civil War right now, working on a book. Hopefully, I'll be finished soon. Um, soon being a couple of years. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but um, a huge part of that is looking at facts that everyone else has looked at and seeing something else, some effort at, at self-discovery. And I think what my dad was able to do was he was able to see these books that were out of print that a large number of people had basically disregarded and to see some significance, some importance in them that had not been revealed before. Um, and, and I think that's the practice of history. Okay. Um, and one of the things we talked about was like how reading and writing go together. What that's do right. you read? When you oh, <laughs> books. <laughs> a lot of books. Magazines. I read the magazine I work for, The Atlantic. Uh, I read The New Yorker. Uh, I read quite a bit of fiction, quite a bit of history, quite a bit of essays. Um, I love poetry. Um, I'm reading Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen right now, and um, I'm blanking on my man's name. It's a long poem called In Memoriam, and I can't think of uh, okay. Tennyson. Tennyson's okay. In Memoriam right now. Um, and I'm also reading uh, The Children of Pride, which is a compilation of uh, letters written during the antebellum era uh, from a particular family. So you're reading a lot. Are you like a, a reader of lots of stuff at the same time, or are you like, I'm, I have this book, I'm going to read it? Well, I'm it usually a reader it. of one specific thing, but okay. it, that's become impossible to do. <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to get this book done. You just, it's become actually much more uh, effective to read more than one thing at the same time. Okay. Um, another thing that I noticed um, in, in finding out about you before meeting you, which is right. always an interesting way to get to know someone. Right. Um, um, one of the things uh, that I found out that um, one of, some of the, the descriptors about you, you write about um, politics, race, and popular culture, mm -hmm. um, history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, but the interesting part was that sentence ended with usually writing about all those things in the same article. So very bringing pieces from all these different areas. Have you always written like that, or is that something you've developed and just seen what? 
the writers I liked always had the ability to do that. You know, it's like a painter. You know, you got a palette and, you know, painters who can use every, as it's needed and not in a sloppy fashion. Mm -hmm. But painters who understand how to use every aspect of the palette, you know, are, are, are the painters that you really, really admire. Every tool that, that need to be used. You mm -hmm. know, I'm not talking about just slopping any color up there. <laughs> but what I'm saying is understanding that you can use all, all sorts of things. Um, the great sort of variety of things as it applies. Uh, I've always wanted to be that way as a writer. Um, I've always sought to use the voice that I thought applied to the particular situation, use the example that I thought applied to the particular situation, um, as opposed to narrowly confining myself to one thing. So if you know something that Michael Jordan did or said applies to this, then you know I'll, I'll bring it in. Um, I'm working on a piece right now, as I said, about Malcolm X and. Uh, some of it concerns uh, hip hop music, some of it concerns my parents, some of it concerns the hairstyles of African Americans, um, some of it concerns uh, black literature on, on, on a whole level. The point is that I'm trying to pull all, all of that into one thing and mm -hmm. try to draw a line through all of it. You know, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter that it ranges out to five different places. If I can make it connect, then, you know, I think that can be beautiful in and that's, of itself. That sounds interesting. That's very interesting, and I'm very happy that you mentioned like the artist because one of the things I know when we are trying to get people to embrace the ability to to write and what they can do, and and the power of reading and writing, um, one of my approaches in my classroom is tell my students that I'm not teaching you so much how to write right. a correct way, but I'm trying to get you to collect a bunch of tools right. and have a toolbox. Right. So right. when a situation arises right. that you need to respond to, you can look in that and pull out the pieces and right. put it together right. so you can have a, a, a response that you understand and right. then a response that if someone talks to you about it, you can you know elaborate on it. And to that extent, one of the, the things we've done, um, I did this semester, was actually take my students to the Grand Rapids Art Museum. Okay. So they could, you know, be talk to the docents and understand a How different like perspective. It. I I was surprised because I didn't um, we I didn't even assign them to you must write about it, mm -hmm. and I had about fifty percent of the students make connections right. between what the artist does, as you were saying, right. and then what they're being asked to attempt to do. Right, right. Um, so then let me ask you this: that you've never really had a you've already had a always had a push to express yourself, and never had a fear of expressing yourself. Um, or because for a lot of people, that's that's a paralyzing fear to say you need to write your write your thoughts and share them with others. Any suggestions for um, students who may feel that way, or people in general, like how to express themselves and to deal with that level of fear, even if you've not. Nobody's better that. than you. I think you just got to understand. And I mean, like as a human being, people aren't human beings aren't better than other human beings. Everybody puts their pants on one leg at a, at a time, and so. Um, one of the questions I often get about the memoir is, well, did you feel funny putting all of your, your family's business out there? And I, and I tell people all the time, as long as my family was fine with it, I was fine with it because I would strip all of them naked and weigh them against anybody. Mm -hmm. um, the fact of the matter is everybody has skeletons in their closet. We all have you know, that, that, that sort of thing with us. And so there's really no need to be embarrassed. I mean, I understand where it comes from. I, I get the feeling of you know, the fear of putting yourself out there. But, if you want to write, you, you really have to get over that. I, you know, it's like you can't put, be a football player and be afraid to get hit. Mm -hmm. um, that's an intrinsic. Hitting is part of it. Putting yourself out there is part of it. It's not an ancillary part. It is the thing itself. Um, it's an essential part of it. So um, if you want to write, I think you really have to get over that. OK. Um, now, you're in your memoir, like, it's clear that the relationship between your father and you and your brothers was very important. Right. What advice would you give, or what would you give to young men who don't have that kind of a relationship? What what kind of um, because we because I would say really that's a rare thing right. um, um, for especially young African American men coming up today. So what 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 could they what could you say to that group of people? You know, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, no, and I'm I'm serious about that. I'm, I'm, you know, because I don't know what would have happened to me. You know, I had a great number of men and women uh, in my life, adults, who really worked hard to steer me and show that I, I don't know what becomes of me. So I can't even begin, like, to consider. That's, yeah, so it's not, I mean, maybe it's a, a situation where, like, because you, you just named, you have other people in addition right. to your father. Right. But it's an essential thing is to find and have someone 
who could fulfill that role and be of guidance to you. Right, no, I agree. Okay. Um, so are there any other people? I know you listed a lot of um, writers, but who, who would you um, say might be um, something that you read or an author who gave you an aha moment in kind of looking at yourself as a writer? Or six, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it happens a lot. It really does. I mean, it it, um, it happens a lot. Anytime I'm reading a good book, it happens. Um, probably the most recent, where I really, you know, this sort of altered my path, uh, E.L. Doctorow's book, Ragtime, um, where he takes history and takes historical figures and brings them to life in a way that I've never seen done before. Uh, all the way maintaining this sense of you know beautiful poetry and sentence structure, um, I had never encountered that. I had always encountered historical figures as being kind of corny in fiction, mm-hmm. and in his uh, fiction, they, they they come alive. They they're actual people, they're characters with all their flaws and all their problems, and everything. So seeing that was deeply inspirational. Um, it really brought home to me a historical figure. It doesn't have to be corny, you know. Okay. It doesn't have to be an inventory of facts from that era, you know. Mm-hmm. The, the characters can be alive themselves. Now, uh, something you mentioned earlier was that you you was you what dropped out of school or kicked out of school twice. How'd you get from that high school <laughs> to college then? Parents, <laughs> like I said, like you said, how could I? You know, I have any, I can't imagine any other way. I mean, my parents dragged me, could, you know, pulled me by the collar and dragged me through. So maybe I guess instead of what can you say to you know the young people who don't have those parental role models? What can you say to parents? Grab your kid by the collar and drag him <laughs> okay. through or her through. Well, usually him. You know, too often him, but you know, grab gra- grab them by the collar and drag them through. I mean, it really is. You know, again, being a boy, looking back on it now, what really needed to happen is somebody needed to keep me from doing something dangerous to myself until I was about 25. And then my brain would catch up with my body. Okay. And I, sh- I think I was okay after that. Okay. But uh, before then, I-, I think I was very much a danger to myself. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'd like to say it was great talking to you today. Thank you. And look forward to hearing what you have to say this evening. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.